little. I'd like to introduce everyone to Marcello Musta, who uh, did a talk in December on his new, one of his new books, The Last Years of Karl Marx. Uh, we have had a, a reading group. Uh, some people here have been part of that group. It has been a, a transformative experience to say the least. And I will say it has brought people together in discussion all the way from Boise, Idaho to people in Switzerland and the UK, along with a few of us in between in places like New York and Toronto. Right. Uh, but it is, it is this type of book that leads to us developing an international left that can be a real opposition. And on that note, I feel very confident in handing the floor over to Marcello to speak on the significance and meaning behind the series of books, Marx, Engels, Marxisms. Marcello. Michael, thank you as always for your kind and generous introduction and uh, welcome to everybody. I will just take one minute um, because today we have a, a very, um, you know, a uh, packed session with uh, three fantastic uh, authors and um, um, I know them also very good speakers. So I will just take um, barely the time. I just shared the two um, links with you. The first one is, uh, uh, um, allow me to share an article that I have written recently, um, just to remind uh, to ourselves that um, this is the week 50th anniversary of the Paris Commune. And uh, this was a very relevant um, event, perhaps the most significant in the history of labor's movement in the 19th century. And I see this as um, uh, a topic that is also connected to some of the um, things that will be discussed today in the session that is entitled Marx and Emancipatory Political Theory. The other link is the link to our series, Marx and Marxism. It is a series that has uh, already published 45 volumes. George Cornell, Alienation and Emancipation in the Work of Karl Marx, over Marxism Liberalism, and the uh, revisiting Marx critique of liberalism. That are the three books that we are discussing today. We have uh, many more volumes coming out soon. Actually, we have uh, five books in production at the moment, maybe for the um, um, proposal under review. So we are publishing around 30 volumes this year in 2021, and the same number next year. That is, um, you know. Um, and uh, relevant um, confirmation that there is a revival for Marx studies and for uh, the Marxist tradition, even more when the revival is uh, done by competent authors like the three that we have today, um, two generations, if I may, like two uh, well-known scholars and one young researcher who has written a very interesting book, and they are revisiting sometimes topics and uh, bringing new perspectives, new ideas. With this series, I welcome all of them. I'm very happy to um, present our series and uh, invite possible book proposals or you know just readers interested in our volumes. Um, sometimes they are online with. Uh, discounts and uh, paperback is also available. Thank you to everybody and uh, have a nice session. Thanks. Thank you, Marcello. I, I am now turning the floor over to Igor, who, uh, and I, I did not pronounce your last name because I think it's Schreichedbrod, but I may have mispronounced. Uh, but Igor, uh, who has put today's panel together on Marx and Emancipatory Political Theory with August Nymphs and uh, George Comnenel will get us going now. And there are still more people joining and I have to get off the screen now. And Igor, Igor. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. I actually uh, would like to say and commend you for your more authentic 
uh, pronunciation of my last name, which is a, a tall order. <laughs> That's the first thing. Uh, it's a word of gratitude uh, also to Marcello for uh, his introductory remarks. And it's just a lovely opportunity to uh, be on a panel, virtual or otherwise, with uh, George Commonell and August Nims, who I see as mentors and also in the case of George, a former teacher. I took uh, George's famous a course on the state and theory and, and practice and historical perspective. And it had a profound influence on me. Doesn't mean we all agree. And that's the, the, <laughs> the fun part. <laughs> right. I look forward to certain disagreements and areas of divergence. But uh, really briefly, uh, why Marx and emancipatory political theory? I thought that uh, our three books in the series are linked in many respects. Linked one uh, because we think that there's something really important about Marx's contribution as a political theorist, as a revolutionary uh, to emancipation or the emancipatory project. Some of you will say, well, aren't other political theorists also concerned with emancipation? Maybe. An argument can even be made that uh, Plato's Republic and the movement from the cave you know, and beyond the cave is a kind of a cognitive uh, liberation for a few. But there's a sense in which Marx is distinguished from all these other political theorists in that he was an activist and a revolutionary. Some would argue above all, uh, more, than a, more than a theorist, okay? But I don't want to create too many controversies right, right off, the, <laughs> off the bat. The other thing, really quickly, I, I dressed up for the occasion by... Uh, oh. was, <laughs> told you so, and we'll figure out what the Marx yeah. told us so. <laughs> yeah, I no longer fit my Marx one, so <laughs> just read. <laughs> no, no pressure at all, no, no pressure at all. The other thing, uh, just logistically, that may be helpful, uh, because I see that the session is being recorded, uh, for those who aren't speaking just yet, if you could please uh, mute yourself. Uh, because what may happen along the way, and this is something I've experienced while, while teaching remotely, is that there's an interception in sound. And this is going to happen as people join us because uh, it, it'll ask, the system will ask if uh, you'd like to be muted. But in between, in the interim, uh, there will be a noise over. So just uh, think about that from a logistical standpoint. In terms of format, I'd like it to be a little bit more informal. But uh, coordination is important. <laughs> and so the way I, I thought would be best to proceed is, uh, and please don't take this the wrong way, age before beauty or something like that. <laughs> we don't know the concrete details here, so I, I don't want to be too controversial. So I thought maybe if George can start, followed by August, and now, uh, you know, the younger generation, as it were, will we'll go, we'll go last. My understanding is that each of us will be given 15 minutes. I think I'll take up less time because I'm more interested in the discussion. And the, the two kind of questions uh, worth considering, I think, in short, the first is, why did you write your book? Uh, what was missing? Uh, and, sec and secondly... Uh, what do you think Mark contributes, Marx contributes, pardon me, as far as the emancipatory interest is concerned? Why Marx and, and emancipatory political theory? I think those are the two questions that will really help us uh, navigate and have a productive uh, discussion. So I'll, that's all I wanted to say in the way of introductory logistical remarks. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion, uh, you know, more broadly and the questions that will follow. Okay, so are you suggesting that I should go ahead at this point? Affirmative. Okay. Um, so I am just trying to find here. Um, well, I, I, I'll start off exactly with the question of why I wrote the book. Um, and that is because, in fact, uh, Marx kept coming up. Due to my interest in um, pre-capitalist um, states and societies, and although Marx mostly wrote about capitalist society, um, I would argue that it's essential that his, his historicization of capitalist society involves locating it in a continuum that includes the transition from pre-capitalist to the capitalist. And it's an, it's an area that is insufficiently theorized, um, although there are, at this point, a number of people who have attempted it not badly. I keep going back to Marx. Um, and I'm sorry, believe it or not, I, 
would have been helpful for me to have considered these questions when I made, made my notes, Igor, but if you could just give me the second part of the question that you just posed, or the two questions, the second one. And I have no doubt, George, that uh, they will be uh, uh, in your notes, uh, because the second question pertains to the emancipatory interests. Ah, what makes okay. Marx uh, distinctive? So I had no doubt because it was in the title yeah. of your book. So. Right. And uh, exactly. Well, um, really, the the reason the, the book is entitled that is precisely to emphasize the role of Marx as a political activist you were suggesting. And that's one of the things that I've always tried to emphasize. It, unlike Hegel, he was not a, a, a philosopher in a tenured university sense. He never had an academic position. Um, he was always engaged in uh, engaged with class struggle and attempting to promote it. And uh, in this uh, commitment at root was precisely the commitment to emancipation. Uh, in my book and elsewhere, I've noted that's not a word that we very much use these days that we consider uh, in, in political theory. But in fact, emancipation was very much an issue of the day. And um, that is one of the essential things that I think that I try in the book to draw out <clears throat> Marx personally uh, came up in the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution. Born in 1818, Waterloo was 1815. So, you know, when Marx was a child, the French Revolution was just barely over. And the consequences of that were profound. Um, and indeed, uh, in France, you know, there was another revolution in 1830, 1848. I mean, French revolutions should be numbered the way their republics are. And that, that speaking going, I've had switched away from the main screen, so I'm not really sure if there's something going on I should know about. Okay, I guess not. Um, so I'll continue. Um, the French Revolution was defeated, and that's an essential point. Um, and particularly important to note that Trier, where, I'm sorry, um, I, I'm getting kind of a squawking sound. Is it? So Igor told us that we should all turn the microphone off. I see that there is Evelyn and there is Max Educational Project that the microphone is on. So that's why you are being interrupted. Uh, but please go ahead, and uh, I'm sure that this comment okay. will turn. All right. I just wasn't sure what was happening. Thank you. Okay. The, uh, the era of the French Revolution was one of enormous struggle. Uh, I've noted in a book that the French Revolution was roughly equivalent to the effects of both World War I and World War II in the 20th century. It was an enormous uh, uh, world event uh, with, you know, corollaries in Africa and the Caribbean and in um, North America. And this uh, uh, struggle ended in the defeat of the progressive forces at first, but they didn't go away. And Trier, where Marx was born, was actually a hotbed of um, liberal reform. There wasn't, uh, Paris was, of course, one of the key places in, in the world in terms of uh, revolutionary development. But Trier, where Marx is from, had a very prosperous um, uh, burger class. But they were all, or overwhelmingly, adherents to the ideals of the French Revolution. And uh, this is one, one of the stories I tell uh, in the book. As when Marx is 15 years old, uh, there was uh, an event at the casino club to which the well-to-do of um, 
Trier belonged. And they got themselves riled up in singing French revolutionary songs and uh, making speeches of a kind that really called for revolutionary change. Now, perhaps they were not as radical as, you know, the revolutionaries of 1848 would have been. But it was really for, you know, uh, what was that, uh, 1830, 1833, that was really quite radical. And uh, Trier would actually send the most radical delegates uh, to the uh, 1848 assembly that was created uh, in that revolution. So Marx came from a very radical background. And without going through all the details here, I think it's extremely important to recognize his personal character as uh, a radical. Uh, the fact that his father was a complete man of the Enlightenment um, and um, his next door neighbor, who is the Baron von Westphalen, whom um, Marx became very close to. Uh, he and the Baron used to take long walks together out in uh, the hills around Trier, talking about fundamental questions of liberty. Um, and Marx uh, really was deeply steeped in the questions of emancipation at a time when there were no civil liberties, there were no fundamental political rights of any kind in Prussia, and where, because Trier had actually been part of France during uh, one era of the French Revolution. Uh, Trier had been the capital of a French département. Uh, so it was literally part of France and um, the uh, citizens of uh, Trier had become citizens of France with all the rights that were appropriate at the time. These were winnowed down over time, but in fact, all the Jews were given citizenship. Uh, there was a, a tremendous uh, stirring up of ideals, uh, of thoughts about equality and, and uh, emancipation. And it was in this context that Marx was going to school and uh, learning from both his father and the Baron, and in some ways teaching them, because Marx very quickly advanced in his matters. So from the very beginning, and this is one of the points I, I wanted to make in the book, Marx's purpose was fundamentally political, to advance human freedom against the oppressive alienation that was manifested in class relations. And that is really the story behind this. That Marx's theory was not, first of all, it wasn't economic theory, um, and it wasn't primarily academic in, in any way. Rather, he was directly interested in class struggle, tried to engage in it and to promote it. Now, in this process, Marx uh, had to confront the questions of historical social development, the history of class relations. And here, in my view, and it's one of the things I've argued throughout my work, um, the essential problem was that Marx was misled by, he came to accept fundamentally liberal claims about class history. Um, liberals had for long put forward some notion of class in history. And so, for example, uh, liberals recognized slavery in the ancient world as a kind of class um, uh, alienation, class exploitation. Now, they were not inclined to see class in the emerging capitalist society. But that was one of the key contributions of Marx. It is, however, the case that in looking at history, his ideas were very much shaped by um, what were pervasive liberal ideas about history. And in this regard, then, we have Marx accepting ideas like bourgeois class revolution at the same time that I argue there's a contradiction between that view and um, his own work. Um, what was also characteristic of the time, besides the French Revolution, was indeed the emergence of 
capitalist social relations, not everywhere equally, but primarily in England. And one of the things that uh, I believe to be problematic is the extent to which people push, and Marx himself did this, push the origins of capitalism into the past so that you have a kind of Baroque period of capitalism. And you can talk about the development of capitalism in early modern Italy, whereas in fact, um, from the point of view of myself and others who do the kind of work that I do, capitalism emerged originally and uniquely in England and only began to spread from England through industrial relations after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So it was just beginning to spread to continental Europe. However, the uh, advent of an age of industry was already becoming clear, even though it hadn't happened over much of Europe. And so at this time, you had Saint-Simon, for example, uh, writing Catechism of the Industrialists, because he recognized there to be a new an industrial age, different in character, and he believed it needed its own catechism. The old catechism had to go out the window because it was a new age dawning. So this was part of the notion that there's a new world forming. And it's in this context that Marx is very conscious of uh, radical developments and wants to be part of it. Um, he did very much engage in the critique of political economy. That was, in fact, the subject of virtually everything he published and much of what he didn't publish. I mean, aside from the Communist Manifesto, his work is almost entirely critique of political economy. However, that critique of political economy was not because he was attempting to put forward a uh, theory of the economy. It was his response to the emerging form of class society trying to expose its class exploitive, its alienating character. And the beginning of Marx's work um, in this vein goes back to 1843 in his Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, actually. He um, first puts forward a critique of political economy immediately after reading the major political economists for the first time. And that then becomes one of the main ways in which he um, synthesizes ideas about society and in particular, the nature of alienation as class exploitation, the way that class is manifested in history and in ongoing um, relations of power. And it's this role that's central in understanding, for example, capital. It's not a work of economic theory so much, although it, you know, it can be seen as that. And of course, it's really the best guide to the capitalist system one could have. But it is, um, above all, a, a revelation of the alienating relationships, the exploitive character of um, capitalist relations and the need to overcome them ultimately through revolution. And so it's this that is at the core of Marx's work, this recognition of alienation and the insistence upon a revolutionary clearing away of that dead weight of the past and the creation of a new world through human emancipation. Um, and um, I, I, at this point, we'll leave off, except to say that one of the things that's absolutely critical here is to recognize in Marx someone whose commitment to radical ideas of emancipation was always at the core. Sorry? I, I'm not sure if somebody's saying something to me. I, I will now wind up here with simply the observation that Marx has to be understood as uh, an active uh, revolutionist. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, George. Uh, just a reminder to everyone else who joined us uh, later, welcome. But please uh, turn off your microphone so that there aren't any interceptions. And uh, August is next in the in the list.
Take it away, August. Okay, thank you, uh, Igor. And I want to thank uh, everybody uh, who helped to put this uh, together, beginning with uh, Marcello and Terrell Carver and uh, uh, Igor, the um, Marx Education Project. Many years ago, I spoke at the Breck Forum, so in many ways, I'm, I'm returning uh, to the Breck Forum. And uh, in a shout out to uh, Fred Murf Murphy, I think, uh, I think I see him on board. Uh, yeah, about uh, about the book itself uh, and its uh, purpose, and in the spirit of uh, what George uh, just said, he is his final comment. Uh, I wrote the book in order to try to first make sense of what's happening in the world in which we live today, and uh, secondly, uh, how to respond politically, how to respond politically to to the world in which we in which we live. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> and in that and in that spirit, I've written something. I had something uh, published uh, recently, which I uh, in which I try to apply uh, ideas from the book to making sense of the Trump uh, the Trump phenomenon, and uh, specifically what happened on January January six uh, this uh, this year, using the ideas of a uh, Bonapartism. Uh, to try to make sense of uh, what happened and uh, how to respond. The title of the piece is called The Trump Moment, Why It Happened, Why We Dodged the Bullet, and uh, What Is to Be Done. It's in, uh, published in legal, in legal form. Um, so that's why, that's the purpose of the, uh, of the book. It's an extension in many ways of my 2000 book, Marx and Engels and Their Contribution, uh, to the democratic, uh, the democratic uh, breakthrough, and that book uh, really encapsulates the beginning of my agenda and about Marx and his partner, lifelong partner Frederick Engels. That is to bring them back into the world of uh, politics. I jokingly, half jokingly, sometimes say that my my project is about how to rescue Marx and Engels from the clutches of uh, political theorists. And the, I, uh, I appreciate what theorists have done, especially in helping to preserve the texts of Marx and Engels against the uh, Stalinist uh, counter-revolution. But in uh, doing that, there was a tendency, in my opinion, to scholasticize uh, Marx and Engels. And so my task uh, is to bring them back into the world of, uh, into the world of, uh, of, polit of politics. I should uh, quickly add, I, I wasn't trained as a political theorist. I was trained as a comparativist, and that's uh, that's the that's the angle I bring uh, I bring to doing this. All right, uh, I argued in my 2000 book uh, from a comparative politics perspective that no two individuals contributed more to the democratic breakthrough uh, in the 19th century than Marx uh, and uh, Engels. And in order for me to uh, really make my case, I, had, I needed to, to do something in the book along the lines of comparisons. And what I did in one of the chapters is to compare uh, the practice of Marx and Engels to that of Alexis, Alexis de, uh, de Tocqueville. And uh, I argued that uh, Marx and Engels had more deserved, more deserved democratic credentials than uh, than Alexis uh, uh, de Tocqueville. I promised in the book, uh, at least I asserted in the book, that they had better better democratic credentials than John Stuart Mill. But I never got around to to uh, looking in detail at uh, John Stuart Mill. And I also argue too that their most capable student, Lenin, uh, also had better democratic credentials than other leading uh, liberals uh, in his in his era. So that's what I promised and argued in the book. And so in the 2000 book. And so what the this book does is to <clears throat> to flush out uh, that argument uh, in a comparative way. And I've coined a label to what I'm doing. And it's called comparative real time comparative real time political analysis. And my argument is that uh, uh, in hindsight, we can all look smart. 
um, someone once uh, joked about historians, they feed off the past. They're like vultures who feed off the past. And the real test of political perspective, I think, is the kinds of decisions we make as things are happening in the moment. And, and the way to really test uh, uh, the comparative uh, merits of political perspectives is to compare uh, a Marxist perspective uh, with liberal perspective. Uh, and that's what I'm doing uh, in the new book. And the first chapter uh, elaborates and details what I did in the uh, first book, that is the comparison between uh, Marx and Engels on one side and Alexis de Tocqueville on the other side. Uh, secondly, in the second uh, uh, chapter, uh, I look at John Stuart Mill and uh, Marx uh, specifically, and uh, with particular focus on the the Civil War. In the first chapter, I should mention, I'm, the comparison is, the focus is on the 1848 1848 revolutions. In the second book, it's on the uh, United States Civil War, uh, comparing Marx to John Stuart Mill, how they read and responded, responded to what was happening in the US Civil War. And in the third chapter, I looked at uh, Lenin in comparison to Max Weber with regard to the 1905 revolution and also the 1917 revolution. Uh, Max Weber wrote, not only wrote, but also acted very much uh, around the Russian revolutions. His, his most detailed political writings ever on 1905 and his political behavior around 1917 with the advent of the Bolshevik revolution also merits attention. And I argue in that case, in that third case, that Lenin, Lenin had better had better democratic credentials uh, than Max Max Weber. And then in the final chapter, I look at Lenin in comparison to, um, to uh, Woodrow Wilson. He was the leading liberal light uh, in the world in relationship to the First World War. Uh, how did uh, both of them respond to the First World War? And of course, the, the Bolshevik Revolution and the outcome, the outcome of the uh, of the First World War, almost exactly uh, a century a century ago, and in that case, I also argue uh, that Lenin had better democratic credentials uh, than Woodrow uh, than Woodrow Wilson. So those are the four cases that uh, uh, I um, um, make uh, uh, an argument for, uh, arguing that if you're looking at what I call again comparing to real time political analysis as 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 uh, judgments are being made and actions are being made as events are actually unfolding and my claim is that uh, 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 the Marxists have performed much better at better democratic credentials than the four than the four liberals that I compare that I compare them with. Uh, I'll just end by pointing out, uh, yeah, my, my, my recent piece uh, in which I try to apply the ideas from that first chapter, that is the comparison with Tocqueville, looking at the 1848 revolutions to try to make sense of the Trump, of the Trump um, phenomenon, and is specifically beginning with what happened on January, January the 6th. Um, in my initial assessment of Trump when he was elected, I tended to employ the label of Bonapartist. Um, I was, uh, I, I thought Marx's memorable characterization of Louis uh, Bonaparte as the, uh, the grotesque me mediocrity uh, was, uh, was also applicable. But uh, upon uh, review, I, and as I got more and more into the 18th Brumaire and looking at uh, Marx and Engels, I dropped the label of a uh, Bonapartist uh, with regard to Trump because midway into his his uh, administration, it wasn't clear to me that he was really wanted to overthrow the Republic uh, in the way that uh, in the way that uh, Bonaparte uh, Bonaparte uh, eventually eventually uh, did, and so I dropped the label and and. Um, and it was clear to me, uh, at least it wasn't clear to me, uh, that he really wanted to overturn uh, the electoral process and to really 
uh, as January 6 approached um, and that um, uh, what happened on January January 6 was unexpected in my in my opinion and indeed he was an aspiring he was an aspiring Bonapartist and how do we explain it and, uh, and more importantly how do we explain why it didn't happen why wasn't there a coup and I'm not the first person who who thought about this the uh, Zainab uh, to affect you, uh, in a piece she did back in December uh, in the Atlantic, uh, speculated and tried to make use of Marx's 18th Brumaire to make sense to try to explain whether or not was Trump really threatening to bring a, to pull off a coup or not. And uh, it was a smart piece on her part, but she left out of the piece the role of liberals. Uh, the liberals in this moment, especially someone like uh, like like Tocqueville, and so basically what I argue is that um, uh, uh, Trump was unable, even though he was an aspiring Bonapartist, he simply was inept. He was unable uh, to bring about a, a coup, and um, uh, most importantly, it was simply not a Bonapartist moment. And in the lead up to 1852, uh, what we see is a steady march of the infringements on democratic rights, especially especially uh, the suffrage. And most importantly, it was the liberal wing, the liberal wing of the capitalist class that enabled that enabled uh, Bonaparte to carry out his coup d'etat. And that's what, what was Trump was lacking. Trump could not find any particular wing of the liberal bourgeoisie to enable uh, what he was trying to do. Whereas Louis Bonaparte had the liberal wing specifically uh, uh, Bonap I'm sorry, uh, Tocqueville. Tocqueville played a major role in enabling in enabling what uh, Louis Bonaparte did. There was no one like that uh, in this moment. And the re and more fundamental reason, as Marx explained in the 18th Brumaire, the working class, and from 1848, especially after the uh, June Rebellion, uh, the working class was a threat to the interests of the uh, of a ruling class. That's not the case in the U.S. We have to be very realistic. <laughs> the, the working class is not a threat, and therefore there was no, no reason for the ruling class to fear, to fear the, wor uh, the working class as the liberal wing of the bourgeoisie and the conservative wing of the, bourgeois, we, uh, the bourgeoisie in France did between 1848 and, 18, and 1852. So, okay, that, that's briefly what I'm trying to do, that is to try to make sense uh, of uh, the political world in which we live, and most importantly, what do we do? What do we do about it? How to respond to it? And I can take that up in uh, more detail uh, during the discussion. Thanks, so you go. Well, thank you, August. That was uh, excellent, and, and to George as well. And as I said at the outset, I mean, I'm inspired and also influenced by your works. And so for me, it's kind of difficult on the one hand to go last, but also a pleasure and an honor, in large part because a lot of what was said sort of is, is in the background of my book and, and why I had written it, specifically with respect to Marx's critical relationship to liberalism. I say critical, uh, not hostile or dismissive, and that's important. And the first thing that really inspired me is a certain um, discomfort, let's put it that way, uh, among Marxists. Uh, Marxist interpreters, Marxologists, let's even say, um, uh, as well as liberals. Uh, these are political theorists or historians of political thought who arrived at the conclusion one way or another that Marx was decidedly hostile to the idea of individual rights, civil liberties, freedom, but also any kind of invocation of legality, constitutionalism, and justice. That really bothered me. Uh, I don't know exactly why it bothered me at first, uh, because I didn't have any textual evidence uh, to point uh, to the contrary, right? And sort of, I was bothered, but I didn't have any evidence to say that they were wrong. Um, as far as the Marxist tradition is concerned, with which we are most interested today, the leading thinker, and I still have a lot of respect for him, even though I think he was wrong, fatally wrong, is Yevgeny Pashukhanis, the, the great Soviet legal uh, theorist uh, who was uh, killed in 1937 and who was committed to this idea of the withering away of law thesis. Right. And his argument, I'll just say it really briefly, is that the legal form or what we call legality in a bourgeois society rises and falls with what he called the commodity form. And he took this uh, he took his cue 
uh, from Marx's capital, particularly in the discussion of the commodity. I think actually a much richer discussion of this can be found in the Grundrisse, where Marx talks, talks about all the presuppositions that have to be in place to, for generalized commodity exchange. And that means the legal persona or the juridical persona, which first appears most uh, coherently, if you will, but still in a very inconsistent fashion in Roman law and in Roman private law in particular. Uh, so why Pashukhanis? Well, one, he, he's a great adversary. Uh, he had the credentials, let's put it that way. He studied uh, law and political economy in Germany, in Munich. Um, although his dissertation had very little to do with his general theory of law and Marxism, I should, I should add, uh, for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of clarity. But Pashukhanis ultimately sides in a strange way with the liberals uh, in arguing effectively uh, that the legal form Right. It hides. The problem with it is that it hides relations of domination that are concealed beneath the equality of the liberal bourgeois legal form. But ultimately, the irony, and this is something that I've really tried to point out in my uh, published work, is that it should be no surprise why liberal legal philosophers like Lon Fuller love Pashukhanis. They love Pashukhanis because what he does is he projects their own assumptions about Marxism and about private property and about commodity exchange, right, uh, back to into, uh, into Marxist tradition. But the issue uh, is, is not just that. The issue is that what is it that Pashukhanis puts in place of the legal form once it's supposed to wither away? Technical regulation. <laughs> Technical regulation, which means that if there's a conflict or a dispute between two individuals, and I'm of the opinion that such disputes may still happen in a communist society because human beings aren't saints after all, we disagree, we'll probably disagree on this panel, but there has to be a form of mediation that exists among socialized individuals. Pashukhanis' uh, conclusion was that uh, any conflict that emerges in a developed phase of communism would be dealt with as a matter of technical experience. So let's say really quickly, I think it's important. He's a very important thinker. Let's suppose there's a relationship between a doctor and a patient, and we are very familiar with that relationship. Uh, if let's say the doctor uh, uh, um, uh, makes an error of judgment, right? Uh, then they should be held accountable, not as legal persons, right? but rather as failing to deliver on their professional status, right, and their professional training. So there is no question of right and wrong. There's no morality. There's no emphasis on the juridical at all. All of that will disappear in the communist society of the future, according to Pashukhanis. But the problem was that who is going to determine, right, the standard for technical expedience? Government bureaus. And we know who that was in 1935, and in 1936. So I've always been troubled by this idea that the legal form would be replaced by technical regulation. Well, technical regulation meant Stalin in that context. And those <laughs> who interpreted technical regulation in a, in a manner that um, was in their interest. Now, Pashukhanis paid the price, right, in 1937. And that's, that's a tragic, I think, a tragic loss for the Marxist tradition and for Marxist scholarship as well which was proven in practice. But the liberal side, liberal interpreters of Marx, and I would even say contemporary critical theorists, Axel Honneth, Jürgen Habermas, and all the rest, and latch on to an even more one-sided interpretation of Marx as dismissing rights, as dismissing constitutionalism, as pure bourgeois ideology. So that's the more facile view, in my opinion, but here's the problem. Facile or not, it has traction in, in, in political theory, and unfortunately, right, in even mainstream politics, the first thing that people point to is, well, the reason why you had tyranny in the Soviet Union and the reason why you have it in every other example is because you could find sources in Marx's work that show his hostility towards the idea of rights. So what did I do? I wanted to take up this question as honestly as I could. So I, I turned to the Jewish, on the Jewish question, the Judenfrage. I turned to the Grundrisse. I turned to 1848, 1849. By the way, I would recommend that everyone return to these writings. Marx is writing for the uh, Neue Reines Zeitung, which August does, for example, in his work. And to look very carefully at the question of Marx's orientation towards the question of rights, towards the question of legality. And I agree with, with August and also with what George said earlier, that radical heritage, right? Let's look at when rights were actually at stake. Let's look at when liberty and constitution were actually at stake. And let's figure out where Marx stood on those questions. And when we do that work, 
as I try to do in the book, we realize that, yes, he was more liberal than the liberals. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's something that should be pointed to uh, each time the liberals claim that Marx was illiberal and undemocratic. <laughs> so, uh, and on the Jewish question, what's the context? Uh, notwithstanding all these the interpretations of Marx as a self-hating Jew and an anti-Semite, which are easy to dis, you know, dispute. Not to, that's not to say that the language that he used was okay, uh, but we have to put it in context. Okay? So the whole, the whole point was to defend the equal rights of Jews against Bruno Bauer, who said that Jews have to renounce the faith in order to be granted equal rights. Everyone, at least mainstream political theorists, tend to forget that point. And even Marxists and Marxologists like to forget that point for whatever reason. Uh, so it was not a, a, a hostility towards rights. It was an attempt to show that we have to understand properly the relationship between political emancipation and human emancipation. If you can't have rights, you can't have human emancipation. It's a prior condition to any fuller conception of human emancipation. Let's talk about 1848-49 for just a moment. The whole point there, Marx returns to the Germanies the German territories, because there wasn't a united Germany. He sides with the liberal bourgeoisie at that point in time, because he thought that that's what would lead to a constitutional revolution in that context. They obviously betray the, that cause, right? But to the bitter end, to the bitter end, he continues to defend uh, liberal rights and the reforms that were wrested from the crown, while liberals are making concessions to the crown. So you won't be able to find evidence there at all that Marx was hostile to the idea of rights. Why is this a problem? Why is this important? Well, you have biographers of Marx like Gareth Stedman Jones uh, uh, arguing the very opposite on flimsy grounds at best because they have, a, they have a particular political project, I would argue, to try to show that Marx was hostile to the idea of the democratic republic, hostile to the idea of rights. And nothing could be further from the truth. But we have to do that extra work if we're interested in those questions. And I think now more than ever. And why is that the case? Which will bring me to, to my conclusion. Because civil liberties and rights are under attack. Because we're seeing more and more forms of authoritarianism. And, and what we do know from 1848-49 is that Marx was on trial. <laughs> Along with the editorial board of the Neue Reine Zeitung, he was on trial by reactionary forces. And he was very clear about the importance of press freedom, about the importance of legality, and all those rights that were won as a consequence of the March Revolution of 1848. And so the goal, the ultimate goal, and this is where emancipation comes in, we have to rethink the relationship between political emancipation and human emancipation, but ultimately Marx's commitment to the idea of social revolution, which the liberals wanted to stop midway through, because ultimately, right, it's about first and foremost winning the battle of democracy. And he makes it clear, you could look at the Communist Manifesto, Engels' uh, principles of communism, that it, it, the first point is, is to ensure, right, that where the working class is not in the majority, it has to ally itself with other uh, groups, right, in the struggle for constitutionalism. But ideally, and, in, you know, moving forward, he was looking forward to proletarian political supremacy, which is the condition, the precondition for winning the battle of democracy and bringing an end to classes. As, as such. And unless we take seriously the struggle for civil rights and liberties, right, we will make the same mistake, I think Marxists, I should say, as the liberals made when they thought that those things can be dispensed with when they're no longer in our interest. Well, no, Pashokanis learned the hard way that they can't be dispensed with, and we have to learn from his errors. Right? And we have to learn from the errors of 1848-49, uh, which is why Marx, I think, as Terrell Carver has shown in his book as well, was actually a, a, a great a critical uh, dissector, if I can call it, of the uh, French uh, uh, constitution of 1848. The point wasn't to dismiss it, it's to show how rights are subverted. Right? And I think that is a much more constructive approach. And if I'm lucky, History of Political Thought will publish a, a revised version of an article I'm working on, Marx and the Democratic Struggle over the Constitution in 1848 and 49, which makes this center stage and attacks uh, Stedman Jones uh, for his 700-page uh, uh, biography of Marx, which uh, is uh, inspired by an attempt to try to present that Marx was hostile to the idea of liberty, to the idea of the democratic republic and rights. We can't take these things for granted. That's what politics is all about. So I'll finish there. Sorry if I went over my prescribed time limit, but I'm, I'm the chair, as it were, right? So I get to uh, undermine other people's rights. I'm kidding, of course. So I think, <laughs> Mike, I'll turn it over to you. And I know that there's a specific policy for Q&A. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Igor, August, and George. Very uh, interesting, and I'm sure there'll be lots. What we like for people to do is to write in the chat. If you don't know how to do write chat or stack, uh, raise your hand, but then you have to show yourself for me to see you. We have one person uh, who has already uh, indicated he wants to ask, and now we have two. So I like to do two or three so that the three of you can uh, give sufficient answers. So we'll start with the first two. Uh, one is James Cregan, and number two is Fred Murphy. So go ahead with your questions. And again, thank you for your presentations. Uh, hi. Uh, yes, thank you all. And uh, I would just like to respond um, briefly uh, to uh, the last speaker, Igor. I will not attempt to pronounce his last name. Um, uh, but um, you seem to... Uh, you seem to um, emphasize uh, that, or you seem to have concluded uh, that Marx uh, was not hostile to the idea of right. Uh, but, but all of his early writings, as far as I know, uh, contain a critique of what he considers the bourgeois idea of right. Now, of course, in the course of bourgeois revolutions, um, uh, Marx was not uh, uh, considered uh, the establishment of a constitutional republic and universal rights uh, to be superior to the idea of estates or the, the or a society of estates uh, against which bourgeois revolutions were taking place, and he was a defender of those rights, uh, but, but he was also a critic of their limitations. And, and um, very briefly, uh, he saw a uh, bourgeois right as an abstraction in which uh, people are equal before the state while being at the same time unequal in civil society. And uh, this mirrors uh, the commodity form in which buyers and sellers confront each other on the market as formal equals as buyers and sellers, regardless of what their circumstances are. Uh, but, but it takes individuals as possessors of rights, regardless of their actual concrete circumstances in society, uh, which class they belong to, and uh, what their natural capacities are. Uh, this is the essence, I think, of Marx's critique of the bourgeois idea of rights, uh, which, he which he thinks communist society will transcend, and this is repeated uh, in Lenin's State and Revolution. Uh, but so, uh, you have, uh, no one is um, disputing your idea, uh, Igor, that um, Marx was a defender of rights and liberties in the bourgeois revolutions of his day. But what about his critique of the limitation of bourgeois right, which you did not mention? Thank you, Jim. Uh, Fred, you are next. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for these uh, really interesting presentations. I just want to have a question for my, uh, I won't say my old, I'll say my longtime comrade, August Nimtz. Uh, I was really not aware of uh, John Stuart Mill of having, having anything much to say about the uh, Second American Revolution, the U.S. Civil War. Uh, of course, I'm familiar with Marx's writings on that, but I would really like to hear uh, more of the substance of the uh, distinction that you draw between Mill's uh, approach and Marx's uh, to that to that event. Thanks. Igor, uh, it's up to you to, I don't know how the three of you want to respond to these first two questions. We have other people ready to ask. So uh, go ahead, George, August, and Igor. Okay, I think, yeah, we should take them individually. Big questions and fair questions. I think at least the, the one that was directed at me, I, 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 uh, I not only sympathize with your concern, but I'm going to try to address it short and maybe even, even address here Victor's point, which is relevant. Don't we have to distinguish between bourgeois individual rights and proletarian or socialist individual rights? So that's what I try to do briefly in the book in any case. And I'll explain why briefly, because there are also epistemological and democratic uh, uh, limits uh, to these kinds of exercises. 
that are in keeping with the spirit of Marx's work, uh, and for good reason. So you are right, James, that I didn't emphasize the bourgeois limitations of rights or the uh, limitations of bourgeois rights, if we may uh, put it that way. Well, first, I want to take you back a little bit earlier than on the Jewish question. Okay, and that uh, is spelled out, I think, especially in recent years, his publication of this book, which was translated and edited by August's uh, um, a colleague, uh, Robert Nichols, and it's called The Dispossessed. And it's the work by Daniel uh, Ben Said, which I would strongly recommend. And he goes uh, to an earlier period of time. Marx's writings for the Rheinist Zeitung, not the Neue Rheinist Zeitung. This is between 1842 and 1843. Marx is still not a Marxist, if we want to use that kind of language, but those were the issues of the social question of the day, particularly the uh, the criminalization of the collection of fallen forest wood that pushed Marx in the direction of the critique of political economy. There, he is not at all hostile to the idea even of bourgeois rights. Why? Because he thought that the Napoleonic Code, and George mentioned this in passing, I think, uh, had a profound uh, influence and impact in that region right, in the Rhenish region or province. So there it's very clear that he's not hostile to the idea of rights. But what you're, what you're correct uh, in saying is that in, on the Jewish question, the first thing that he does is he distinguishes, some argue artificially, between the rights of man, quote-unquote, and the rights of the citizen. You won't find him criticizing the rights of the citizen as distinct from the rights of man. What are the rights of man that he criticizes for their limitations? You're absolutely right there. Uh, liberty equality, property, and typically it's security, right? So uh, is he against liberty? By no means. Is he against property of a certain kind? Absolutely. He's against bourgeois private property. Uh, Sorry, my my dog is being, uh, (laughs) he's not agreeing with my interpretation here. Um, But he's not opposed to, as we know, in uh, capital, uh, to the idea of individual property, individual eigentum, that makes he makes it very clear that in that transformation from capitalist private property to associated production, the workers don't get uh, pri- uh, capitalist private property, but they get individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist there. So that's important. He wasn't hostile to that idea. Uh, then equality. You're absolutely right. Uh, equality before the law, but everyone is unequal, as a matter of fact, in civil society and in fact, de facto. Okay. Uh, security is even more connected to capitalist private property. So you're right. He points to the limitations. None of these rights, he says, go beyond, uh, beyond pardon me, the uh, egotistical individual separated from the rest of the community. But I think even there, the issue that really uh, pushed him was that in the context of, you know, this bourgeois revolution, I know this is going to bother George, but that's how Marx, that's how Marx frames it. Right. He talks about the French Revolution, uh, even on the Jewish question. And there he his main concern, I think, is that the rights of man are supreme and they they undermine the rights of the citizen. And the point is to bring them together. So in our everyday life, we're not divided right, between being egotists on the one hand and being social beings and equal on the other. But my argument and my interpretation is that doesn't presuppose the transcendence of rights as such. It does, it, it will have to presuppose the supersession of certain rights, exploitation, right, that lend to exploitation, for example, on domination. But uh, obviously, you're right to say that he points to the limitations of bourgeois right. Now, what about the commodity form? Because a part of your uh, of your point uh, also resonates with the critique of the Gotha program, right? In the Gotha program, uh, based on what you've said, uh, Marx points to the defect of even bourgeois right in the first stage of communist society, precisely because individuals are taken uh, only from a one-sided stand. Everyone is seen as a worker, nothing else. That's the defect, right? And then, right, eventually what happens is he says, you know, with with the development of the productive forces, if you want to put it that way, there will be this relative abundance and society will inscribe upon its banner, right, a different principle, right, from each according to their ability and to each according to the, But the narrow horizon of bourgeois right is surpassed. Not all horizons as such and not all right as such. So I sort of agree with Victor's point here that it's important to distinguish between bourgeois individual rights and proletarian or socialist individual rights. And why do I argue this? Because in the Grundrisse and elsewhere and also in Capital, Marx says that every form of production creates its own legal relations. And if communism is going to be a form of production, then it too will create legal relations that are in keeping with that form of production. 
there will be some carryover, right, uh, from a bourgeois society. And the Grundrisse makes that very clear, uh, that the precondition for free individuality, right, is made possible by the proliferation and the generalization of exchange relations. He did not want to go back to a society that didn't even recognize individuals as legal persons. That's what Pashukanis didn't appreciate, and that's what Marx appreciated, maybe because of his legal training, short as it was, and the influence of Gans, who was a Hegelian, uh, who was a close student of Hegel, Hegel's favorite student, apparently. And so what I would argue is that, yes, you have the transformation of Recht, all right. But transcendence, at least as I understand the word in English, means leaving behind. That's why I choose supersession. And that's why I think it's important to understand or to view the critique of the Gotha program and the language that's used there from a Hegelian lens. Because in Hegel, the term the, in the science of logic that's relevant here is avgehoben, which means three things at once. It means the negation. It, ne it means the, um, the preservation of certain things. I would argue legal form, for example. And finally, it means raising to a higher level, right? Now, if we just say transcendence, that means ne mere negation. But what's going to take the place of the legal form? Pashukanis gives us an answer, but that's a very terrible answer as far as I'm concerned. So I don't know if I've, uh, if I've uh, answered your question, but Bill Bowering, uh, to whom I'd like to say hello here, has posted a link to his review of my book. That may or may not be helpful. I don't want to prejudice your interpretation, but I'd be happy to continue this conversation. I think it's a very important one. And it's important, as you point out, James, to, you know, emphasize also the limitations of bourgeois rights, which Marx did. And I didn't emphasize in my presentation. So that'll be my part. Sorry for the extended answer. I think it's a very important question and a, and a legitimate one. If I can just jump in here, two things. One, I very much agree with what Igor was just saying, particularly with respect to the critique of the Gotha program. One of the latest things in Marx's writings uh, had political implications and really significant. It's true, Marx is critical of bourgeois law, bourgeois rights, as he always was throughout his life. At the same time, he makes it absolutely clear that on the morrow of the revolution, and here we're not just talking about for 48 hours, we're talking about for a substantial period until the real social relations in society have been transformed, you have to rely upon bourgeois rights. You know, and he makes that really clear. And it, you know, it's evident that he would like to get to the stage where it's from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, but that's not an overnight transformation, Marx recognizes. And in the interim, you have to be fair. And fair is the kind of thing that's very bourgeois. Nonetheless, it's real. Marx recognizes it. What I'd like to add to that is that this has a lot to do, for example, with the conduct of an organization. And Marx, in his role in the uh, First International, was always bound by what might be described as liberal democratic principles of action. And when Marx was actually asked to reform rules, the standing rules of the organization, he reinforced that. So he, he lived with a very concrete determination to abide by majority rule even though the majority was almost always against him. But he never abandoned the idea that majority rule was appropriate. And, you know, one, one of the essential elements in the definition of who can be a member of the uh, Working Men's Association was everyone, everyone who agreed with its principles could be a member. And that most extensive uh, version was written by Marx after he had already experienced problems with being on the losing end of, of certain debates in the, uh, in the international. And so there's no question in my mind that he was genuinely democratic and that to a certain extent he was willing to abide by formal democratic rules even where they seemed to work against the socialist uh, position that he recognized. And I think that's really significant. I mean, to my mind, one never need a 
uh, hold back, you know, and uh, this agrees with both with what both Igor and August have been saying. One needs to recognize that he wasn't a Democrat, you know, come by chance. He was deeply democratic and was prepared to live by the consequences, which to me is everything. I'm can sure I, both uh, Igor and I could keep talking, but <laughs> we don't need to. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, and as a prelude to uh, answering uh, Fred Murphy's uh, question, that if I could just add on to what George and uh, Igor have uh, have Jeff said, um, I'm a part of my agenda also is to bring Ingalls into the discussion and to see, treat Ingalls as a part of a partnership. And uh, I can't emphasize enough uh, uh, the comment, the reply that Ingalls made in 1892 uh, to a critic uh, claiming that uh, he and uh, Marx uh, ignored uh, the question of uh, democratic, democratic reforms. And his response was, quote, <clears throat> Marx and I for 40 years repeated ad nauseum that for us, the democratic republic is the only political form in which the struggle between the working class and the capitalist class can first be univer universalized and then culminate in a decisive victory uh, of the proletariat. It's an, again, uh, he said for 40 years, we, we said this ad nauseum. And so I, I, I wanted, to, uh, wanted to raise that. Regarding uh, Fred's question, yeah, no, it's an important uh, question uh, uh, about uh, John Stuart Mill on the Civil War. Yeah, the Civil War is, is the biggest uh, democratic breakthrough in the 19th century. We should never, ever forget, uh, forget that. And so for uh, liberals like uh, John Stuart Mill, yes, the Civil War was very much on his, uh, on his uh, agenda. Uh, Mill had written uh, quite a bit. Uh, about the United States. Uh, remember, it was Mill's review of Tocqueville's two volumes, Democracy in America, that really brought to the English-speaking audience uh, the significance of uh, Tocqueville's, uh, Tocqueville's books. And in fact, Tocqueville uh, once said that if you wanted to understand what he was trying to say, uh, read Mill's review his review of, uh, of both volumes of democracy in America. So yes, the United States reality was very much on, on um, uh, Mills' uh, Mills's agenda. And, uh, uh, and before Marx, he was already commenting on the problem of the slaveocracy, the, uh, the slave power, and his critique of the slave owners. Uh, he wrote an essay uh, critical of Carlyle, Th Thomas Carlyle in, 18, in 1850. Uh, so yes, so generally, uh, Fred, the uh, Marx and Mill were on the same political page about the Civil War, the need to defeat, the need to defeat the uh, the slave the slaveocracy, um, and but Mill approached it as a liberal and as a nationalist, whereas Marx came to the question as an internationalist, prioritizing the interests of the uh, of the working class. And uh, that's, I can get into more detail uh, uh, about that. That's the, uh, that's the, the first difference uh, between them, um, Marx and Mill on the Civil War. The second major difference uh, relates to the 11th uh, thesis, the Feuerbach thesis, the 11th uh, thesis, <laughs> the philosophers have only interpreted the world in certain ways, the point is to change it. M Mill was the epitome <laughs> Mill was the epitome of, of the critique in <laughs> that marks a critique of the philosophers. And <clears throat> Mill was simply not willing to put in the time and effort to defend the union, Lincoln and the, and the union, in a way that Marx was able, uh, uh, was willing to do so. It's important to remember that Marx dropped everything when the war broke out he suspended his research and writing on capital in order to devote all of his time to defending the union and Lincoln against the uh, conservative bourgeoisie uh, in England. Um, for a long time, it looked like the conservative bourgeoisie 
uh, would actually lead the charge to intervene on behalf of the Confederacy. So the task, the political task uh, in England was to defend Lincoln and uh, the Union. Uh, <clears throat> and the problem that Marx faced was the fact that Lincoln had not declared the war as a war against the abolition of slavery. So Marx has to anticipate, has to anticipate what Lincoln would later do before Lincoln actually does it in order to be able to defend uh, the Union and, uh, and uh, uh, Lincoln. The problem is that with Mill, Mill understood that also too, but Mill was a nationalist. And for a brief moment in the war, something called the Trent, the Trent Affair, um, there was a possibility of war between the Union and, um, the, uh, uh, and England. And uh, uh, Mill did not want to come out in favor of the Union and Lincoln because as a nationalist, as a nationalist, he, he couldn't make up his mind on what side to take in case there was actually a war. Whereas uh, Marx, uh, with limited resources, uh, with limited access to the media uh, within England, devotes an enormous amount of energy and time to uh, what he called the struggle in the press to come to the defense uh, of the Union and Lincoln against all of the major bourgeois venues like the Economist, the Times of London, who all favored, who all supported the uh, Confederacy. So yeah, so um, uh, the big difference uh, between Mill and Marx is that uh, Mill approaches a war from the perspective of a nationalist, from the perspective of, of a liberal, uh, whereas Marx approaches the war from the perspective of a communist and, an internet, and therefore an internationalist. I can, uh, Fred, if you send me an email, I can go into more details about uh, what I'm referring to. <clears throat> and I would just point here, uh, Engels. Engels, of course, was a capitalist industrialist dependent on cotton. And nonetheless, he was entirely supportive of the North from the beginning in a situation where it created enormous difficulties for the business with which he was supporting not only himself, but also Marx. Nonetheless, he never backed away from it. And um, one of the later things that Marx did was at the end of the war, because in fact, Britain had built a steamship for the South, the Alabama. And that was contrary to the rules of law. Um, so when the North won, they actually wanted an exorbitant uh, penalty uh, uh, against England. I mean, uh, 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 they talked about a number of billions of dollars. Um, or at one point, uh, the Secretary of War said, or we'll take Nova Scotia and the Red River settlement from, from Britain, you know, a big hunk of what is today Canada. And that's, you know, really indicative of the extent to which, one, uh, Britain was in the wrong. And, you know, actually Marx was siding with bourgeois law here. You, you don't go around in a war and engage in what is against the rules of law. If I can just add to what George just said, George is absolutely right about uh, Engels uh, and his attitude uh, toward the uh, the Civil War and in support of uh, Lincoln and the uh, Union. There is, interestingly though, the only sustained debate I've found in the literature uh, between Marx and Engels was uh, during the war. Engels tends to be more pessimistic. He didn't think the, uh, the North was prosecuting the war uh, vigorous enough. Uh, whereas uh, Marx uh, corrected Engels and said, Engels, you're paying too much attention to the military side of, uh, of affairs. You need to pay more attention to the, to the political, political economy side of affairs. I think that debate lasted between them for about almost two and a half years. And I know of no other uh, differences, political differences. Uh, and it's only when the, the North began winning that, uh, that, that Engels <laughs> became less pessimistic, but for a long time, yeah, that was a that was the, that was a difference between them. Well, uh, 
Thanks, everyone. Um, Carl Cohen is ready with a, a question. I don't see that anyone else has indicated one, so we'll take Carl's and see if during that time anyone else asks. But go ahead, Carl. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and have uh, co-convened the Radical Caucus of the American Psychiatric Association for many years uh, and have uh, written uh, a book along with uh, people in critical psychiatry in the UK called Liberatory Psychiatry. So this was uh, an interesting topic for me, and I learned a lot about political emancipation. But one of our concerns has been about personal emancipation. And uh, I've been less satisfied with how Marx addressed that. Some of his early works in the 1844 manuscript uh, dealt with species being and a kind of humanism, uh, which his notions of these things, I think, were very tainted and by bourgeois society and, and socially constructed kinds of notions of what humans are. Uh, and some of that was also picked up by the Frankfurt School and Marcuse and followed that kind of thinking. But I, I'm curious what some of the speakers have to say about personal emancipation and what their view of that might be. So thank you. Can I, can I start first? I'll try, I'll try to answer. This is, so one, maybe to take inspiration from the feminist movement here that the personal is political, right? I think that, uh, it really uh, is central in Marx, right? That, um, look, uh, if we talk about ontology, I don't know if this is something that's uh, discussed much in, in psychiatry and in psychology more generally, this concept of ontology. Marx had a social ontology, right? So usually liberal, so you mentioned that it was, his account was tainted uh, to a great extent by the uh, bourgeois society in which he lived. Well, the bourgeois society in which he lives relies on an atomistic ontology that you have the Robinson Crusoe's of the world. Although I always remind <laughs> the readers, Daniel Defoe, that there was Friday, but Friday wasn't recognized as a person. <laughs> so he wasn't even, even Robinson Crusoe or in Castaway wasn't by himself, right? And Marx makes this very clear that even language, like what we're doing right now is impossible without human beings. This is in the Grundrisse, uh, living together, speaking with each other. So there's a sense in which uh, he was very critical of the liberal atom, atomized uh, ontology, which still reigns supreme. You think of methodological individualism in philosophy, for example. Uh, and so the category that he uses in the Grundrisse is the social individual. But that's not the hol holistic individual, and that's also not the collectivized individual, if we can put it in those terms. It's an individuated self, which means that human beings are different, right? And we can't put everyone under the same kind of standard. Right? But human beings exist in a society and, and freedom, he says, you know, very clear in the, in the German ideology, which again wasn't a complete work and shouldn't be treated as such. Right? It, personal freedom is only possible in, in a social context, right? not in uh, uh, Daniel Defoe's uh, world. Uh, so I, I would say that there are actually quite resources that may be helpful for you in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, which again, wasn't published or wasn't intended to be published. These are notes, right? Uh, although we treat them as kind of canonical. Um, uh, one thing that I've always been struck by, uh, Marx's realism, he talks about the sensuous aspect of human beings, right? We are suffering beings. That's in the, that's in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. And what does that mean? It means for him that we are finite beings. We're not perfect. We, you know, we feel pain, right? And I think that that's what needs to be paid attention to. I think the worry that uh, that you've put forward is that somehow the self, right, the psychic self, if you will, to use Freud here, gets dissolved in this concept of species being. Well, there's a debate about the, what happens to species being in Marx's account. Some uh, Marxist philosophers think that he gave the concept of uh, species being up because it would lead to very conservative implications. So once you define what it means to be human, Right to be a labor, you know, creative, uh, uh, laboring being, right? And and they they sort of hint uh, to giving it up in the German ideology with this metaphor that's used of the fish in the water in the river. So what is the essence of the fish? Well, to swim and to be in the water. Someone takes some poison and drops it in the river. Suddenly, the essence of the fish has changed, right? So I think there is a debate about that. In fact right, that Marx may have uh, worried about uh, simply making recourse to this concept of species being, because how do you account for change, 
that human nature is malleable and dynamic as far as Marx is concerned. So there is an, an ongoing debate about right what happens to species being. There is something like species being in the Grundrisse and in capital, Marx talks about producing in a manner worthy of human nature, right? Uh, we could debate, you could debate about these, these points, but I actually think, you know, I'm more charitable here to Marx, like this point that we, we are suffering beings, isn't that, uh, isn't that quite helpful though? And far from the picture of a sup, uh, species being, sup, being, being superimposed and basically dissolving the psychic self? That's an open-ended question, <laughs> not a rhetorical one though. Um, again, just jumping in, with respect to the issue of alienation, um, there is in Marx's work, a development of something that began with Hegel and was pursued further by the left Hegelians or the young Hegelians. And that had to do with the social, but also um, personal psychic dimension of alienation. I mean, the term alienation comes from exchange. It comes from buying and selling. I mean, that's where it originally comes from. In law, you alienate something when you sell it. And, and that is the original meaning of alienation. And in fact, it was taken up by uh, theologians after Luther, uh, possibly including Luther, with respect to the alienation of man, as I always put it, humanity, from God. That in fact, it involved a separation, which was uh, concrete and, and real. And uh, so that uh, adds a dimension. And, and one of the things I think is important is that in the 1960s, and I can roughly guess that uh, Carl, you will have some recollection of this as I do, that it was largely uh, from psychiatry and psychology that the move to expand the understanding of alienation came forward, often very much in connection with the 1844 manuscripts. And so alienation came to mean and there's something very particular in North American society, uh, which was, you know, very much tied to, oh, I'm bummed out. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a psychological condition. And it's a, actually for a long period of time, teaching about Marx, one had to recenter alienation on, in fact, the loss of material, the, the experience of being told what to do, not simply being bummed out in some individual way. But that element of it was actually brought in around the time of Marx, not, I would say, primarily by Marx, but with Marx. I mean, he, he certainly engaged with the left Hegelians in important ways. And one of the things he never challenged them on was his broader understanding of alienation. When you read the 1844 manuscripts, it does become clear that he does have a sense of the person uh, suffering, the person who actually, as a result of capitalist society, capitalist social relations, is less of what she or he would be. And that is, I think, a key element of the uh, notion of species being, that Whatever it is, it is undone by alienation. And so emancipation is required to recover what is natural to ourselves. And that may be less, you know, the, the fixed thing uh, than is often believed. You know, human nature may very well be social and malleable. But the fact remains, alienation is the antithesis of being a free human being. And so that alienation is something that must be addressed. And I think precisely, you know, Marx was a long time before Freud. There's a lot that, you know, came to the core of, of uh, social thought, and which we can find, for example, in critical th uh, theory that Marx didn't have access to. But I don't think it's too much to say that Marx was on the right side of those issues before the time. Uh, I'm in total agreement with what George and uh, Igor uh, have just said. Uh, again, for me, 
I'm always interested in how, how do we make sense of the world in which we live uh, uh, today and thinking about the lockdown, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the problem of social isolation, um, being in the individual home, not being able to be with coworkers uh, in the job. And uh, you think about uh, uh, the toll that the isolation uh, has taken uh, on uh, on individuals and on the working class. And uh, I would argue that uh, from a Marxist perspective that the way out of this is really for workers coming together in the workplace when we are there actually in the workplace, not, not sitting here in the Zoom world, but actually in the workplace and fighting together and struggling together. <laughs> That's the way we will overcome all of the psychological sickness. Uh, that the lockdown that the lockdowns have uh, generated. I just want to add, if possible, to because this is something that uh, was pronounced in George's course uh, that uh, I remembered, and and I think it it you know another source uh, that may be pertinent is of course Marx's um, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, the introduction, and the point that's often misinterpreted or misquoted or quoted very selectively about religion and the opium of, of the people. It's the heart, right, in the, in the heartless world. It is the sigh of the. Uh, so he's not it, it, unlike Freud. It's, religion isn't a delusion for Marx. It is a real expression, right? Except we have to go deeper, right, to, than the beyond the critique of religion, in order to, you know, really uh, get to that sense of fulfillment, individual and social. That's why the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, not the free development of all as the condition for. And I think that matters because it shows that he wasn't um, limited to this collectivist notion of the self, but rather the individuated. Uh, self and the one thing that uh, George also mentioned is this uh, sense of being bummed out is also a certain feature, right, uh, uh, of uh, of alienation. So when I teach uh, the economic and philosophic manuscripts, or even between 1843 to 1844 in theory courses, what I do is to show the different meanings. And even in German, two different words are often used and are conflated, right? So one is the colloquial, uh, you know, exchange, right? Alienation is exchange. The other is a projection that we project our human attributes onto an alien being, and then that comes to dominate us, right? Human beings are, uh, you know, imperfect. God is perfect. And then God dominates us for being imperfect, right? And the third one, which I think uh, uh, George correctly pointed out, is something like anomi, which is what uh, George uses as an example in the course. And this, of course, also intersects with, you know, social psychology and various sociological theorists. So Durkheim is one example. Merton is, you know, the, these are the um, functionalist uh, uh, sociologists. Uh, but Marx obviously takes it in a different direction and uh, in a revolutionary direction in terms of what is required for overturning that kind of, you know, experience. Uh, in, in beyond uh, both Merton and beyond uh, or Talcott Parsons. And I think it has to do with this idea that in our everyday life, this is connected to what, to, uh, what August said, in our everyday life, we have to actuate th that species being. That's on the Jewish question. So that we're not divided between, you know, or he uses uh, Hobbes' war of all against all. That's that are, you know, that's the experience of living in a capitalist society. On the one hand, we, we are social beings. On the other hand, in every instance in the market, right, we're forced to compete with one another. And the only way of getting ahead is by bringing someone else down. It's a zero sum game. So I think, you know, it's, it's we have to look at the relationship between the individual and the social in Marx's account. And the only way we could achieve fulfillment is, you know, through this revolutionary process. Uh, that's what's going to get rid of uh, all senses in, in a way uh, of alienation. Uh, although I would argue that the exchange, something like exchange or mediation would still take place, but it would not take the form of capitalist exchange relations. That's all for me on this point. Thanks to everyone. Uh, we have uh, Bill Boring, who is going to make a, sh a brief comment. And then uh, if, I don't see anyone else with a question. Do, do you have your hand up, Kashmira, to ask a question? Okay, uh, Jim, you are uh, you are also on this round, Jim Cregan. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I'm really glad to be here with you. I've already bought a ticket for the next one, um, so I will hopefully see you there as well. It was a great privilege to um, review Igor's book, also, and I think he thinks that I did some justice to it. Any goes. 
I think there's a problem here of lawyers. I don't know if there's any other lawyers in the room as a matter of fact. And I think lawyers are generally desperate to try and construct some kind of socialist law or socialist theory of law. And I think Pashikhanis is an example of that. Just on the way to Pashikhanis, of course, Marx trained for a little bit as a lawyer and got very quickly very fed up with it. Uh, and his uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right is not, it is absolutely not a construction of another theory of law, no. I mean, he might have got around to writing a book about the state and intended to, but he never did. So we don't know what he would have uh, written, actually. And Lenin, of course, was a practitioner for a short while and wasn't terribly good at it and went on to do other things after his brother was executed. Um, uh, and the things he w went on to do were he was very good at. And Pashikhanis, of course, was somebody who did his... Um, uh, doctoral thesis on labor law in Germany. And actually his uh, first experience was as a legal practitioner, as actually the main advisor to this Soviet Russian foreign ministry uh, in Berlin on the negotiation of the Rapallo Treaty, uh, in which he made quite a considerable uh, contribution. And he wrote his general theory while in Berlin <clears throat> didn't get published till a few years later. And that's why when you look at the references in the general theory there to Kelsen, you know, he's really engaging actually with the German language authors. Now, how does he construct a theory of a socialist theory of law? Well, he does his best. And I think Eagle's right, you really have to grapple with it. And there he is. And he has followers around uh, these days. But he actually, he can't do it. It breaks down. Uh, and this is particularly unfortunate for him because on the basis of his theory, he says that um, communism having won, or at any rate, Soviet Russia being in place, law should disappear. And it manifestly didn't. And he had to retract. And colleagues of mine have written about the huge legal apparatus that there was in the Soviet Union, which had nothing to do with socialism, by the way. And Engels and Marx were very, very clear uh, that you could not have a socialist theory of law, nor you could you have socialist law. What workers had to do, as in the struggle for the 10-hour day, was fight for legal demands, absolutely. Um, and Igor quite rightly makes the distinction between law and right. Um, so there wasn't a theory of law, but nor actually was there, there was critiques of rights. Of course, you had to have them. But nor was there a theory of right, and nor did he intend to write one, nor did Engels, as a matter of fact. So um, I do think it's a disease of lawyers, and Pashikhanis is a good example of this, to want to, I mean, they, they think we're lawyers. I think a good lawyer is a competent lawyer who is able to use their skills for the interests of the working class. And I think the National Lawyers Guild, which I admire great, greatly, has never had delusions that they are the revolutionary vanguard or that they are constructing a new uh, theory of law. They serve the working class in the working class struggle as good, competent lawyers. And just finally, a very short anecdote, which I like, which is that, as you know, the translator into English of volume one of Capital was Sam Moore, who was a big pal of Engels's. Um, he was a barrister in Manchester, and I'm sure they went fox hunting together as Engels did, and drank uh, good red wine, but he ran out of work. And so he got a job as a colonial judge in what is now Nigeria. Did he get any flack from Marx or from Engels? No, he didn't. I mean, you have to earn your living somehow under capitalism. Um, and when he died, Engels made an oration at his funeral. So I leave you with that. Uh, anyway, Eagle, great book, thank you. Th thanks, thanks, Bill. Uh, I'll just add. I mean, the only you know, uh, well, t two sources of, as you know, uh, uh, Marx's engagement with the law. One really practical when he was on trial. There, the skills were really on display, and I think that's important and under theorized. And it's also fun to read because he kind of applies his uh, materialist conception of history to d to defend himself, right, and through the Napoleonic Code. I, I find that pretty fascinating and kind of strategically very interesting to those who say that. Marx 
Sheriff's had no interest, you know, in the law. Well, it, when it mattered, he certainly did. And he apparently sued others uh, for questioning his yes. reputation, right? I, 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 I had to add that he spent a whole, took a whole year out of writing capital to write this uh, book on how to vote, which nobody has read except for Igor and me. I think he really... <laughs> And he took it enormously seriously. And why did he write a whole book? It's because his legal guys got nowhere. Yeah, well, maybe his honor was at stake. That's the, yeah. other fe the feudal uh, remnants. But uh, yeah, for those who are interested, for those who are interested, um, you know, I think it's important also to read his very early critique of the historical school of law. Uh, because there, right, uh, the representatives of that school were some of his teachers. I mentioned Gans, who had a profound influence, a positive influence on Marx. But the other was Zavigny. Right. Uh, and he was really critical of this historical school marks, even in the early years, in large part because they instead of using reason to use that Hegelian standard, they used tradition, uh, the tradition or the spirit of a people to judge the validity of law. Uh, Marx takes the side of the Hegelians there, of guns, that reason is the basis for judging positive law or laws, right? And I think that's important because that also distinguishes, uh, distinguishes him in many respects from other thinkers, including in the Marxist tradition, who are very instrumentalist with respect to the law. Sure, I think you're absolutely right you, in your review to critique me for not paying attention to that uh, very helpful piece, in fact, by Bernstein and, uh, and Engels, Juridical or Lawyer Socialism. Uh, Absolutely. Very good. Yeah, very, very good. If I, if, if I could just add to what the Eagle just said, uh, Michael Heinrich's uh, first yeah. volume, um, uh, really, really great. And one of the things I learned is uh, the courses that Marx took in college. He took six courses, six courses on uh, jurisprudence, and so he was he was thoroughly, thoroughly acquainted with the best with the best uh, in the literature at that time in Europe. Just one more footnote, sorry about this. Uh, so the greatest critic of Gantz in the German literature is Hering. Uh, Hering, Hering, who wrote The Struggle for Law, um, which a lot of people have forgotten about, but Hering was a huge influence on the American realists, actually, which they acknowledged. And through the American realists, you know, so Hering is somebody they really respected. And actually, the critical, critical legal scholars also built on the realists and on Hearing, by the way. And Hearing was really took Gantz apart in detail. So Jim Cregan had another stack question or comment. So go ahead, Jim. Yes, and more a comment, I think. I would like to see, I'm returning to the question of um, <clears throat> they're from the um, psychologist as um, uh, to uh, personal emancipation. Um, I don't know exactly what he was referring to, but I'd like to suggest uh, that Marx did have a, an idea, a very definite idea uh, of, uh, of what in general human fulfillment would consist in. And I can't hope, uh, I can't uh, hope to sketch it in detail here, but just uh, let me give a few broad indications. Um, Marx uh, was, contrary to many and contrary to uh, the prejudices of the Second International, um, Marx uh, did put forward as early, in the as, uh, early as the 1844 manuscripts, a theory of human nature, uh, which was present um, in many uh, commentators to the contrary, notwithstanding, was present throughout all of his work, early, middle, and late. And uh, the basic outline of that theory of human nature is uh, that um, human beings, the, uh, the activity of human beings, and it is the activity of human beings uh, that defines what they are, it uh, takes place along two axes, uh, one in relation to nature, and the other in relation to society. Man's uh, self-reproducing activity, or I should say human beings, I don't want to use gender, gendered nouns, human beings' uh, self-reproducing um, activity in relation to nature uh, is, is uh, something that they share uh, with animals who must also do the same. Uh, but what distinguishes human beings is that um, their intercourse uh, this is a favorite term of the early Marx. Their intercourse with nature is also simultaneously a social act. 
um, and um, and it is this social nature of human beings uh, that um, realizes itself in history. Um, Marx is uh, Marx uh, thinks there is human there is a human nature, but it is not a static human nature. It is a it is a it is a nature which realizes itself in history. And what is the end of that? Uh, but what is human uh, fulfillment and happiness as opposed to alienation? In alienation, to sketch this very briefly, man's or human the activity of human beings along these two axes uh, in, reg- in regard to nature and each other is uh, is uh, yeah, they experience as a loss. Uh, when alienation is overcome and in communist society, uh, the activity of humans in relation to both nature and society will not be will not be experienced as a loss of individual powers uh, but but will be a source of self confirmation uh, in which uh, individuals expand uh, their powers and capacities through the activity along these two axes that was very helpful <laughs> Uh, can I say something? Uh, uh, okay, well, Carl. Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, Carl's comment, but then Igor, George, and August will uh, okay. do the round after you, Carl. Uh, well, it was just a uh, response to what was said. I, I guess, my concern about uh, the emancipation and Marx, and, and and in general, has been in the early manuscripts. It was based on the species being, which I already suggested is. This suggests a, a, a nature to it, but I think it's really socially constructed nature, and I don't think Marx realized that. Uh, later on, I think it became the essence of human beings was seen as the ensemble of social relations, and that was picked up by many people. The problem with that is it disembodied humans. When you began to see human nature as just the ensemble of social relations, we forgot about our biology, and and uh, and and I think that's important. So we need to somehow find, make maybe radicalize our, uh, our biology and 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 use it in a way that we recognize that uh, the ins- that we have a a biological essence to us as well, and to understand that. And that can be done through science, I believe. Uh, we have some notions of now uh, uh, that, uh, like mirror neurons, which uh, say something about our ability to relate to other people in, in, in empathetic ways. We an unconscious that exists that uh, we can understand human psychology better, and and understand, of course, our own biology and its relationship between mind and the physical being. So I don't want to go too far afield, but I think there's been some movement to Marx away from species being, which has some essence of biology in it, into this uh, essence of human beings being social relations. And we need to bring that together, if you will. Maybe there's a dialectic there that we have to combine them again in some form. So that's my thoughts on that. The three of you have quite a task to bring Jim's comments together with Carl's, but Go ahead. I, I could try really quickly. Uh, well, I think what uh, what uh, James said was was quite helpful and quite accurate. Uh, also, to remind everyone that for Marx, emancipation was always a return to the self from that loss. Right. That's what's said in the German ideology and elsewhere. That it's always a return. Right. In the sense of fulfillment, if we think of the critique of uh, Hegel's philosophy, right, the introduction, uh, so that uh, man and that the gendered language of human beings in general are kind of their their own true son. Right. Instead of circling around these alienated categories, I want to connect this with what was just said uh, about, uh, you know, the issue of the ensemble of social relations. And this goes back, ironically, to what uh, James has said as well, that the emphasis can't be on the abstract, but has to be on the concrete. The concrete self is not an abstract self. The, The abstract self gets dissolved. Right. Because everyone just looks the same because we only take them from an abstract uh, point of view. But Marx was concerned with the concrete individual, 
right? That's what I tried to mention, the social individual. And those are differentiated individuals. They're not simply kind of lopped into these abstract categories. So there is a sense in which, uh, you know, there is continuity in this emphasis on species being. So uh, what came to my mind in Capital, for example, uh, is how Marx approaches labor. Right. So, you know, the big the question, this is also good as a, a teaching method. What distinguishes the best uh, uh, the best B from the worst architect? Right. That's something of a continuity between the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 and capital. Right. It's that the architect is able to abstract well, in this particular case to imagine the project that they will then realize in reality. Whereas at, with animals, uh, non-human animals, the idea is that they're really limited. Right. And that um, uh, they can't abstract, at least to the same extent. And and one of the things that occurs in this discussion of alienation. And ah, Marx... <laughs> Bill, I think your 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 uh, sound is. <laughs> I'm not going to translate the Russian, but any in any case. <laughs> The, the point the, the point is that Marx be, uh, then makes this uh, claim uh, that uh, in a capitalist society, right, human beings are reduced to their animal functions, and the animal functions are these kind of really limited functions of reproduction, right, and mere survival, whereas human beings are capable of so much more. And I would agree with Jim that that aspect, the dynamic conception of human nature, of what is possible, there is continuity in capital into capital, and then later life's prime want. Labor, you know, it can't be any clearer than that. So labor could potentially become a life's uh, prime uh, want. And uh, I think I think we have to think about that. That's a sense of fulfillment, too, uh, in, in a way that Adam Smith, for example, and others, you know, they had this original sin theory of labor. Well, labor is always a disutility, right? It's, this is this is what we have to do because the sins, of, you know, a certain interpretation of our forefathers and mothers, right? So anyway, I'll, I've already said enough. Well, I just wanted to add something. Well, two things. The first is kind of background, but I don't know of a political theorist who had a, more of a sense of literature and the revelation of humanity through and in literature than Marx. I mean, uh, his knowledge of Shakespeare was astonishing for somebody who, you know, learned it in, while a German in, uh, in his teens. Um, also Dante and, I mean, many poets. Um, he, he was a really incredibly well-rounded person. And therefore, when we you know, look at what Marx says about species being. I think, I think part of the key is he always has something concrete in mind, but he doesn't do a lot of spelling it out. And it's as difficult in a way to spell out the idea of species being or human nature as it is to spell out the nature of communism. That, you know, it, it, it's in its concrete form, it embraces many, many, many things, and it's very hard to say anything about it without saying everything about it. And so you don't get a lot of discussion of what species being or, you know, or human nature means in Marx. And I think that he always has a profoundly social understanding of it, but a social understanding uh, in the same sense that we are social beings. I mean, we're animals. And, you know, the the introduction to the Gundersen is one of the places where that comes through most fundamentally. It's where you see um, uh, Marx recognizing, for example, that we don't have language except as living beings and the social process of learning from each other. But that has a lot to do with everything we are as personalities, as, as living beings. And so I, I do think that um, the effort to deal with the abstract that, that Jim is referring to is problematic. And we don't want a very abstracted sense of, um, you know, human nature to be the basis of, of our judgments. In many ways, what I think we, we need to do is to recognize alienation as something that is so profoundly negative that it will, you know, dissolve and attack 
human nature, whatever it is. And, and that human nature is a protean capacity in us. I mean, we, we can be architects, we can be poets, we can be many things. Everybody is, to a certain extent, uh, engaged in production, both of the mind and uh, with our bodies. And, and we reproduce this amazingly complex society that we have. And you know, one of the things about, and here, I, 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 I in many ways prefer to understand Marx as opposed to Hegel, but there is something fundamental about Hegel's understanding of things that is what attracted Marx to him in the first place. And one of the things is that, as far as we know, human beings are the only sentient being. And our understanding is collective. And so the the mind or spirit that Hegel is constantly referring to can be understood in a very materialist sense. What we human beings think is the only thinking that there is. And the ideas that we have are real. We talk about them. We know them. They're out there in the world, in a sense. And yet they are absolutely rooted in human beings, for real. And that is something that I think is very much in Marx's um, conception, Marx's consciousness, that human beings are peculiarly socially conscious beings. And that um, in many ways, you know, we're too precious to be subjected to the kind of alienating experiences that we're constantly subjected to. And that's why we need to be emancipated. We need to emancipate ourselves so that we can actually be the kind of wonderful beings that Marx recognizes to be or want and to really be. Since, uh, since George mentioned the literature, I can't help but uh, point out that uh, one of uh, Marx's favorite authors was uh, Balzac. And think about all of the portraits uh, and all of the <laughs> all of the, all of the <laughs> examples and realities and variations of of humans uh, that Balzac uh, uh, presents. Um. George, August, or Igor, are you finished with the, uh, your comments to Jim and Carl? We are at 3.30. Just a real quick question to all three of you. Since today's topic is liberalism versus Marxism, and the three of you have been engaged teaching, I know that I did not start out my life as a, a teenager or an adult as a radical or Marxist. I had liberal ideas. I grew up in a little town in Michigan and uh, was against the war and, and was horrified with what was taking place down south when I was a little kid in the civil rights fight and was over time won over to a, a radical and eventually a Marxist point of view. How do you, and I, and I feel that all of us who think that we are on the left and identify as Marxists, need to really figure out how to win over many who have liberal points of view. So I'd like if the three of you could quickly talk about your educative experience, your pedagogy in dealing with liberals as Marxists. Though, and that's a big question and almost a panel in and of itself, but just as a way of closure, I think it would be great if you could. Well, uh, if I can begin, uh, all of my writings are really uh, informed by my students, and um, my students are my <laughs> my uh, primary audience when I'm when I'm writing. And so, uh, my book is called Marxism versus Liberalism, and I'm I'm <laughs> very conscious <laughs> about what I'm about what I'm doing. And, and again, the test for me and the test for ideas, the validity of ideas is what's happening in the world in which we live? You know, what's, what's happening in this moment? And therefore, to what extent, how do, how do you compare these two rival uh, political perspectives and making sense? 
and making sense of what's going on at this particular moment. So that's just exactly why I wrote my, my Trump uh, article. I, I do this in the class constantly, trying I begin in the classroom about the world, the world, the political world in which we live, in order to make a case for uh, uh, for the Marxist perspective. I'm a, I'm a product of the of the Jim Crow, the Jim Crow reality in New Orleans. Uh, I was born in 1942, and I grew up <laughs> in the Jim Crow system. <laughs> I saw the reality of the law. <laughs> I learned very early to make a distinction between justice and the law. Um, uh, my my life was guided by what I could and could not do was was guided by the reality of the law, the Jim Crow racial segregation legal legal system. So I learned very early to be skeptical, to be very very skeptical about the legal system and about the law and its in its limit in its limitations. So I always try to draw on my personal experiences and uh, try to make a case and explain why it is that I became attracted uh, to the uh, to the Marxist to the Marxist perspective. Thank you, August. Um, Igor or George, would you like to speak? Um, well, maybe we'll go in declining age order. <laughs> um, it's funny because uh, I, I grew up in the United States. I've lived in Canada now for 45 years, but I'm born and raised in New York City. So I have a whole U.S. background. And interestingly, um, my family was not liberal. Uh, they, they were not fully developed politically, but I did have two uncles who were active members of the John Birch Society. So where I came from was more a radically libertarian right than anything else. And so liberalism wasn't part of what I understood. Um, I, I am embarrassedly supported Barry Goldwater for president in 1964. I was, however, only 12 years old. Perhaps some will forgive me. But the thing is, one of the things that I do have a real appreciation of is the way that the far right in the United States is grounded in some of its basic liberalism. I mean, it, it's actually Lockean liberalism taken to an extreme if its government is no longer convenient that produces the mindset of the people who are in the, uh, uh, close the, Malicious. And uh, I understand that background. Advantage. And so one of the things that I do in my teaching is to point out that liberalism has a hard side and a soft side. And um, one of the things I also point out is that many of the things that we treasure the most about liberal legal relations and you know, the liberal framework of the uh, social order, were instituted by members of the ruling class in self-defense, in defense of themselves as a ruling class, or rather as individuals in a ruling class, against a state which had potentially enormous power. And so one of the things that I do point out to my students is that you know, Marx is an anti-statist. Um, in some ways, you know, you could say he was the first systematic anarchist, although, of course, what he understood by anti-statism is not what most anarchists consider today. But um, the point behind this is that he uh, very much saw the, the real humanity and then he, he, he recognized that this framework of uh, social relations had value to people who understood what power could do to them. The people who were worried originally about being put in the Tower of London, and something most of us would never worry about, um, understood that they needed a legal system that was grounded in certain conceptions of rights and procedures. And that that appreciating that this was invented by a ruling class for self-protection 
is one of the reasons that we should look upon it with some care, not be too immediately dismissive of it, but to be critical of it, because it's both a product of the ruling class and yet at the same time, something that they sought to protect themselves with. And I think that's an important aspect of what it is to understand liberalism. In a way, it's a worthy adversary. You know, it's it's done some good things for people over time. And, you know, as August is pointing out, um, in the United States, there's not a lot you can point to on the part of the state and say, boy, good thing. Except, I mean, the United States did become a society that ended slavery. And eventually, a mere century later, roughly, got around to dealing with the consequences of that to some extent. and. You know, racism is as real as it ever was, but there are, you know, legal structures that are available to be, you know, relied upon and, and used. And that is something you guys, and Marx would have realized that. Um, so that's one of the things that I think, and I, I, I try to draw this out with my students because of one at the same time, I'm scathingly dismissive, I wouldn't say dismissive, scathingly critical of liberalism, uh, having never been a liberal. I mean, I'm one of the few people who, I wasn't raised as a red diaper baby, I was raised as a, whatever you call that, horrible, you know, re reaction, political position. But um, I never was a liberal. I, I left all the way from being a radical right winger to being a radical left winger without ever uh, inhabiting comfortably the ground in between. And so I, I feel as if it's important to be able to tell people that actually the ground in between is not altogether bad. It's, it's worth thinking about seriously as you're being critical of it. Um, and I do point out some of the ways in which Marx was only too happy to rely upon law and rights as a way of protecting himself and other human beings. Now, as, as Igor pointed out, I actually haven't read the uh, Marxist contribution to those trials. I, you know, there are so many things in Marx. You, you feel, I'll read all of this, but I'll put that aside for us. So I've now read, like, virtually all of the letters, but I haven't read that stuff, so I'll have to go in and immerse myself in it. Well, George, I'm going to send you my uh, my draft in which you're cited as well, Marx and oh. uh, Marx's context. Uh, so hopefully you you enjoy it, and there's some kind of uh, passages here and there. My biography is is is, is different from uh, from uh, that of August and, and and George. In fact, I I was born in the former Soviet Union in Tajikistan when it was still part of the Soviet Union, and uh, I came to my Marxist convictions. Um, or I I think it's it's not only a conviction; it's also an approach. Right for analyzing society and also understanding yourself and your place in the world in Canada, and it's a really brief uh, story. Uh, I, I took a um, I took a, a high school uh, class in economics, and as always, you know, they try to really uh, break things down, and you have to pick either Adam Smith or Karl Marx. And you know, the popular the popular move is to just pick Karl, uh, pick uh, you see I, not a slip of Karl Marx, I want to say, but Adam Smith. Right. And so I returned home and my dad was uh, was wondering what I was up to. And I was getting curious about this stuff. And he said, so what's going on in this class? And I said, well, you know, we're going to be comparing and contrasting Marx and Smith. And he said, well, who are you going to be writing in favor? And I said, Smith, of course, there's so much blood on Marx's hands. And so on. <laughs> this is what I was fed. Right. Um, right. In Canada. And I think, you know, in general, this is the product of the of the Cold War. And then he says, well, look, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Marx either. Uh, I think there are a lot of flaws, but he was brilliant. And, uh, you know, this is a, a child of the Soviet Union. <laughs> my, my father, who, who was educated there, he says, well, why don't you actually read what he wrote and then come to your own conclusions? And that's, you know, I dedicated my my doctoral thesis to my father for uh, inspiring me to do that. So I read the Communist Manifesto. I'm like, wait a second. You know, it had this kind of effect that many have, have mentioned that, you know, it's kind of like the poetic value of verse in this case. And I looked at the world and it just seemed that Marx was right and Smith was wrong, you know, and I, and ever since that moment, uh, I, I, and I just, began to immerse myself in that literature. And then I had a personal experience. This is wage labor, uh, uh, nothing close to, you know, factory labor. So I don't want to, you know, exaggerate here. But I was invited to an interview. This is to be a swimming instructor. 
in Toronto uh, at an elite uh, school. And I was told for the first time to sell myself, to market myself. And that was so foreign to my consciousness, I don't know, for whatever reason, that uh, I was, I was kind of shocked. That, that what, what am I supposed to do here? And so it bring, brought that to life. And then the, in the same employer who tended to treat me well and gave me raises for my uh, teaching instruction, at some point, you know, I got uh, injured uh, with my ear, swimmer's ear and whatnot. And I asked if... Um, if I could have an alternative position for the time being in order to pay for the bills. And the response was yes, but I never heard back. And that's what taught me what it meant to be disposable and replaceable labor. And all of that, of course, is contained (laughs) in Marx's work. So there are sequences of events. And so what I try to do, I mean, in my capacity as a teacher, I always try to present the thinker uh, as they understood themselves. And I think we owe it to our students, regardless of our commitments. And I do that for Marx. I do that for Nietzsche. I do that for Locke, though it's very difficult. With John Stuart Mill, it's especially difficult because there's a tension between his elitism on the one hand and his democratic not only credentials but commitments (laughs) on representative government. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Uh, But, you know, what I would say uh, um, is that for me, the, the strongest point in, in, in Marx's approach is that practice is the objective criterion of truth. It is our experiences in the world that shape who we are. And that's why he thought, you know, the working class through those experiences has that revolutionary potential. It, it, the fact that they're brought together, uh, right? And they have to work together in a way that wasn't possible, let's say under feudalism, right? Hence the derogatory remarks about peasants and the sack of potatoes and whatnot, that, you know, I think that's uh, the practice is the most powerful teacher. It can go in many different directions, uh, but we, we have to take a stand in the world. And that's the stand that I decided to take. So that's my little biography, short, significantly shorter than George's and, and, and uh, August's uh, biographies. And I just add to what Igor said, it reminded me of something. <laughs> I teach a course called The Struggle for Democracy and Citizenship. And uh, the first assignment is to read uh, the U.S. Constitution and uh, the Communist Manifesto, and to compare and contrast both documents with regard to how they treat democracy. And so what the students learn, uh, much to their surprise, <laughs> from the very beginning, uh, is one of those documents, the word democracy never appears in it. <laughs> and so so the, te- the puzzle for the course is how to explain, how to explain uh, that reality. That's what the course uh, eventually does. Okay. Very good. So thank you, August, George, and Igor, and Marcello, thanks for uh, coming in today. It was great to see you, and thanks to everyone who came. I found today to be one of the highlights of our winter spring so far, uh, and we really appreciate you coming, and would like all of you to come again, perhaps, uh, By the time the Marx Engels Marxism series is done, you will each have new books that need to be part of another panel presentation. It would be great if this happens. And uh, thank you for your time and going over time with us. And come again. Our website is marxedproject.org. There's lots of other events.